All right, hello uh, again everybody and welcome to today's webinar titled Learn how Daimler AG optimized roles of RFC and other technical users in SAP. My name is Michael Kummer and I'm your host. Our speaker today is Julius van den Busche, Director of SAP Security at Exciting. This webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link with the recording after the webinar. We will have questions in the middle and at the end of the webinar. To submit the question, please use the questions tab in your GoToMeeting control panel. Thank you very much and enjoy the webinar. All yours, Julius. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, my name is Julius von den Busche. Uh, this presentation originates from uh, what was first presented in October at the German DSAG uh, annual conference as an experience feedback on uh, technical user security hardening, which was performed at Daimler. Uh, it was a joint consulting project between Exciting and SAP Consulting, where we provided uh, some of the content and uh, technical expertise and software with which we performed the project. And from the SAP side, consulting resources uh, with which we performed the project. And this presentation is split into two main parts. First of all, just so that we are all on the same uh, ball, uh, some general information to why Daimler decided to improve the security of their technical users and what the risks involved are. And the second part is uh, the project scope and uh, how we went about uh, uh, hardening the technical users setup and their authorizations at Daimler. So, there's the overview of Daimler, uh, overview of the project scope, introduction to what the risks are and how we went about doing it. And at the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. If you would like to ans ask interim questions, then on your panel on the right, you can also type in questions there and uh, click on send and uh, perhaps we can then on the fly take care of some questions or, or if it's currently a topic which we're busy dealing with, uh, then we can handle it right there and then. So overview of Daimler, in case you don't know, Daimler, uh, also better known as Mercedes-Benz uh, for their cars, is a worldwide manufacturer of cars and trucks, vans, buses, and also have related financial services uh, around the, uh, the vehicle industry. <clears throat> they have a revenue of 150 billion euros. They have almost 300,000 employees. They have um, passenger vehicle sales of 200 million units per year and those are 2015 figures, all of them. Trucks, half a million of them sold in 2015 and vans and buses 350,000 uh, units sold. They have affiliates in nearly every single country worldwide. The SAP systems are also used from all the countries where they are active. And the headquarters are in Stuttgart in Germany. And uh, all of their finance and accounting systems and, and uh, related systems, also HR, are running on SAP. And these systems, there are some global systems, there are some local systems, there are manufacturing systems. The, they are all heavily integrated with each other via uh, technical connections uh, within the system landscapes. And that was our, uh, the scope of our project. So what we did was we had a pilot project first, which was Daimler Trucks Manufacturing in the plant in Mannheim in Germany. And uh, there we did first a stock take of all the different connections and interfaces that were running, and they were in total 250 inbound program interfaces coming, delivering data or making calls into the system. There were 300 outbound interfaces um, going out of the system, making calls to foreign system, delivering data or triggering the extraction of data from foreign systems. There were in total 105 uh, technical users, so system users, which were used uh, either for RFC connections to foreign systems or RFC connections coming in from foreign systems. Uh, 
um, they were also um, a relatively small amount of batch users, about 10 batch users. At this point, uh, it's also um, correct to point out that Daimler Trucks Mannheim have a central batch administration, so they have a small number of batch, user, batch administrators who are administrating the jobs, and accordingly they had split the uh, batch users per module and didn't need any more granularity uh, than that. And they also made use of uh, ICF services, so web services, uh, where they had technical system users in the web services, which uh, were called from primarily from outside of the system. So <clears throat> the initial analysis of all these various scenarios produced a grouping of them, of the 105 users, in such a way that in the end we authorized all of these various scenarios using 18 PFCG roles uh, which were uh, mapped for this landscape, so per landscape in the system, uh, to the scenarios that they were uh, providing the authorizations for. So some roles had more than one user, we didn't, it wasn't always necessary to create one role per user, we could group them if they were performing similar or compatible tasks with each other. So. Uh, these can generally be grouped into the following <clears throat> types of scenarios. So first of all, we had solution manager monitoring, both in and outbound, which uh, they had uh, deployed. Then there was an exchange infrastructure or PI system, uh, now PO system, but they still have a PI system, process integration, which was performing both RFC calls and also making web service calls uh, to to the SAP system. Then uh, they have globally uh, financial reporting and BW extraction uh, running against all of their systems from the central finance uh, system and the central finance reporting system. Then the plant in Mannheim also made extensive use of production orders uh, which were coming in from external systems, so they had both internal RFC calls coming in from CRM and from uh, uh, SRM, and they also had non-SAP applications which were calling web services within the SAP system via uh, uh, system users in, in the web services to process production orders. Those could all be grouped into one type of scenario and we could provide one role. There was no necessity for providing any differentiation um, as far as org levels are concerned and whether the user then posts via uh, production orders, via SAP GUI transaction or via remote API or web service, it made no functional difference. Then they made extensive use of work, uh, workflow, <clears throat> so the WF minus batch user uh, was in scope for the ERP scenarios, primarily also related to production orders, but it was not compatible with what the external applications were doing. And uh, also IDOC processing was still in, in place for uh, master data replication. <clears throat> Sorry. Then <clears throat> the uh, application jobs which they had, uh, which were primarily during the night processing data within the system, could be grouped into those relating to MM, so material management, and those relating to uh, PM, production uh, um, plant maintenance, and they had separate batch users already for those, we just needed to adjust the job step user in selected cases, but that was uh, already uh, from the setup perspective, the users were way over authorized, but the design of the jobs was already uh, well thought out. Then they also have an external job scheduling uh, tool, <clears throat> which uh, also made use of some custom development of their own. So on the one side, this external job tip scheduling tool was itself an RFC user and also it was at the same time scheduling batch jobs within the system, but it was operated by the batch job administrators. And then the usual basis jobs that one sets up as SAP standard jobs and the security related jobs that they had, uh, um, that PFUD, et cetera, uh, that needed to be authorized. They split those two so that security could be separated from the basis. 
And uh, finally, they also make extensive use of archiving uh, of older data and data that's not needed anymore is already processed. So there were daily archiving jobs <coughs> that were also uh, performing RFC calls to an optical archive uh, within the system landscape. But these are the scenarios that in the end produced 18 roles, which covered all the authorization requirements <coughs> of the 150 users, which were running 250 uh, inbound interfaces. <coughs> the project plan was to, uh, for six months, perform this uh, proof of concept uh, project uh, on the Daimler-Mannheim systems. And uh, that happened between October 2015 when we started the project and finally when we stopped monitoring. So we were already live in early on with some of the users. Other users we had to wait until February. Uh, and by March the project was completed. <clears throat> there were in total two consultants, so myself from Exciting and another consultant from SAP who were working on the project. These type of technical user projects, it doesn't really help to throw a lot of manpower at them, but uh, rather take uh, two people with experience in it and uh, work systematically on it. In total, um, there was also 10% full-time equivalent from Daimler, a resource from the basis who was responsible for providing with us some information and um, uh, transporting, importing into production that Daimler did themselves. So that was our single point of contact within Daimler with a relatively low uh, resource requirement from them. Um, the uh, first day on the project was to initially analyze and design the roles which I had shown on the previous slide to work out how many roles we're going to need and how we're going to group them. On the second day already, we had already built those roles and what we did then was that we activated uh, a, a function which we call simulation mode. We'll get to that in a moment within our software, how uh, you can simulate whether a role would work or would not work for such a, a uh, technical user without having to make the brave step to really switch it live. Now, that is very important for these projects because often these interfaces and this processing are only happening in production. That means in many cases you don't even have an opportunity to test or do a unit a test in the test system or do a unit test in development because either the connection is not there at all or even if it is there the jobs are often which are triggering it are often not running and even if they are running there is often no data so the job ends quite quickly with nothing to do and doesn't actually perform all the application checks which are really needed. That makes it very error prone and risky because you have to uh, test in production, literally, uh, because you have very restricted means to do that in the, using the normal unit test and test system testing scenarios and then only go live in production. So the simulation mode was started very early with roles which we knew would be incomplete uh, but the simulation mode uh, gives us the opportunity to leave the, system, the user, which in some cases, for example, had SAP all beforehand. We built a new role and using the simulation mode, we could activate a logging which would tell us whether the check would have failed by distinguishing between whether the authorization check was uh, successful because of the role which we had built or separated whether the SAP all or equivalent authorization was responsible for setting the return code to be a successful check. We could split those two in half. And uh, then on the third day, we went live already in the test systems. And they activated role builder agents to monitor the test systems. But the production systems, we had to give uh, a lot of time. So in total, we didn't have 100 days work to do. We built the roles and let the simulation mode run and came back a month later to check to see what uh, it had produced for, for authority checks which would have failed but didn't. And uh, depending on the type of processing scenario, these sometimes 
could be activated, could be, we could go live with them very quickly and other more complex scenarios we had to take up to a hundred days until we got the final users live. Now, uh, some, some RFC connections such as workflow are very talkative and they are doing the same thing all day long and solution manager monitoring does the same thing every day. So those are quite easy to authorize even if there are lots of authorizations because one has within one interval of monitoring or of simulation, you have the same things recurring over and over again without lots of exceptions in between. So with users like that, we could go live already quite quickly, knowing that we simulated on the first day and found five simulated errors which would have failed. And on the second, we fixed them. On the second day, there was nothing. The third day, nothing. Tenth day, there's still nothing then one can reasonably, safely uh, go live with such a user. Others, which are much more complicated uh, scenarios, such as uh, IDOC uh, processing, which it has month-end dependencies, or uh, something where the user can influence what is going to be called, they were much more complicated, and we simply had to give them more time. But it was very low effort, because the simulation mode did most of the work for us. Once we were live, we activated so-called role builder agents from within the software. What these do is that, much the same as the simulation mode, they permanently, actually in three second intervals, they are monitoring to see whether the user has any problems, or real failed authority checks. And if there's any problem in production, then these role builder agents jump in and create a new Delta role with only the problem in it and assign it to the user. That means that the processing can carry on uh, as if it was a little network error in the processing. The program, the RFC infrastructure from SAP can handle small delays and within three seconds it corrects it. And uh, that is necessary because normally these type of errors happen at midnight or at two o'clock in the morning when no one's there to fix it. And so, uh, one can use these delta roles as a work item list of things which needed to be produced. But uh, we only had very passive, um, uninteresting things that happened there because we already caught all of the would have failed uh, checks with the simulation mode. So there was continuous monitoring going on, but a relatively low uh, effort uh, because there were not many errors that came in. Then, uh, once we had completed this uh, POC in um, Daimler-Mannheim plant, uh, we continued the rollout uh, in Daimler Mexico, Daimler Evobus, and the rest of the finance, central finance systems that had have um, the same connections with, with the same authorization requirements, but running against all systems in the whole of the Daimler group. So, the scope for further rollouts was changed to roll out certain scenarios of these RFC connections and not system by system, which is also what we had recommended. So, where's the risk in RFC? The, uh, what RFC stands for remote function call, so you have a client program, <clears throat> let's call it system A, and that client program in SAP has the capability of calling function modules, which are executable program packages, uh, either locally within the client system, or it can also, if they are remote enabled, they can call them on foreign SAP systems. Now, uh, you can imagine for yourself, you have SU01 transaction for user administration, and there you can create users, you can delete users, you can change users, and all of those functions within SU01 have remote enabled function modules <clears throat> which correspond to these uh, functions within the SAP GUI transaction SU01. So for creating a user, there's BAP user create. For deleting, there's BAP user delete. For changing, there's BAP user change, etc. And there are thousands and thousands of these remote enabled function modules within SAP that uh, allow almost all business functions that you can think of via the SAP GUI there's a remote enabled equivalent to it, which does not call any dialogues or show any screens, it just processes it in the background. And they can be called remotely. Now, uh, 
when those calls are made, the RFC port uh, at the network level uh, and application gateways that are from not from SAP cannot really speak the SAP language. All they see is communication coming through on a port and you can't close the ports between different network segments, at least not within the server network. You can't close the RFC ports because otherwise a whole bunch of things won't work. RFC is used very intensively within SAP. And uh, what uh, then happens is that if you are on system A, so the client system, executing the client program and you call BAP user delete via an RFC connection which has logon credentials for a foreign system, then if you call BAPI user delete and delete the user DDIC, for example, via a destination, it won't delete DDIC here in the client system, it will delete it in the target system. So you can remote control via the authorizations of the user which is in this connection, perform tasks without actually authenticating yourself against that target system. So it's very important to design these RFC connections in such a way that they can only do that which they are intended to be doing, such as extracting master data and replicating it in its own system, and is and that is done via the authorization framework within SAP. You can correct, correctly authorize the user to only do what it's meant to be doing or is programmed to do. If you give it SAP all authorizations, it can do anything to the target system and if a user on the remote system knows how to operate these function modules or call them, they can call any of these function modules and as long as they're authorized, they will be able to do what that function module has been programmed to do. If the authorizations are not restricted, then there's no restriction uh, from the, um, then there's no restriction in the, the uh, target system to defend itself against the calling system. So, um, I see we have one question. So, how many systems were in scope? Uh, for the initial POC, there were three systems in scope. And uh, that was because the proof of concept in Daimler-Mannheim was chosen on a system-based scoping. That meant that we uh, concentrated on the users in those three systems and uh, corrected all inbound and outbound interfaces that they were running. We did not touch authorizations outside of the boundaries of that system. Then for the remaining rollout, <clears throat> it was switched to a scenario-based scope. So we did uh, the, the next steps were the connections uh, for the central finance system or the connections for solution manager uh, monitoring. Uh, that is actually a much better approach than using a system-based scope because then you can, if you find all the connections, the RFC connections going out of a system, they must arrive somewhere. So if you have the overview of all the outbound connections, you can see all the inbound users they are running under and you can do them in slices which are based on these scenarios. So you can go live with all the Solman users, then you can go live with all the central user administration RFC connections, then you can do all the finance reporting, then you can do all the BW extraction. That is much more efficient and less error prone uh, than using just one single based scope. I hope that answered the question. There's the first one there. You're welcome to ask questions in between. Then I see that. Uh, we are still responsive there. Okay, um, so that's RFC, how it works. The user on application system A starts some transaction which has is programmed and capable of calling function modules via destination. In the extreme case, for example, of transaction SC37, the user can even choose which function module and choose which destination he wants to run it against. There is an option uh, also within the source system, option V, to protect the destinations against the caller. So the user, you can even control it within the system. Um, it's an exotic uh, solution, but it is very useful, for example, where you have a solution manager which has a multiple of customer systems attached to it and you want to differentiate between customer A and customer B or you want to differentiate between production systems 
and uh, non-production systems, as an example. Then the RFC call is made into the um, target system. There, key authorization object is S underscore RFC, by which you can control the function groups of those function modules, or a little bit like S table disk for tables, they are set in groups, or you can, in, uh, if required, even uh, control the function modules at the level of the individual function module itself. And if you're authorized to start the function module, then, of course, those function modules can perform additional authority checks. For example, the BAPI user delete will also check S user group for activity 06, and without that, you cannot delete users. But, of course, if the user has SAP all in the RFC connection, then nothing's going to stop him from deleting any user uh, on the target system. What one must also consider is that the source system, uh, the person logging on to the source system, so system A, is logging on to one of the clients within that system. But the RFC connections going out are client independent. So if you have, if you're going to SM59 and looking at your connections, or you go to SICF and you look at your services that you have running there, then they are running outside of the system, or they are at least being started from outside of the system, and you can see them from all of the clients. So uh, what we had to do, or what we did, was to not just concentrate only on the productive system. There, there were the most calls, but we also adjusted the authorizations in all clients within the system uh, so that all of the clients were hardened. From a risk perspective, if you only do the productive client, but you leave, you neglect client 000 and leave the connections there with SAP all, then uh, anyone wanting to misuse the connections or out of convenience uh, get data from the production system could also simply from whatever client they are in call the, the connections to client zero uh, and, and do whatever they wanted to do there, create users or read uh, data from foreign clients from there as well. So we did all of the clients. And because the weakest RFC client in the whole network of connected systems uh, is the weakest point in the chain uh, from a security perspective. What we also had very few cases of, uh, but we checked all of them, was that the where there were RFC connections in development systems, then and there was a user also saved into the RFC connection, then we ensured that the uh, development systems are only having connections to development systems, the test systems to test systems, and the production systems amongst themselves. And we corrected the authorizations in all of the systems. So also the development systems, also the test systems, also the production systems. That's necessary because particularly if the developers are not used to it, that the RFC connections will show some authorization resistance to functions they are calling, then they must discover that already during a unit test of their job or the unit test of the RFC connection. And uh, latest when you do a functional test of it, because otherwise everything will work fine, but then it will not work in production. And typically, from experience, have all this thing as a temporary measure is back permanently, and that happens quite quickly. So all systems and all clients were in scope. Uh, a bit of homework to do beforehand was to check to see that the RFC authority check was actually turned on. In earlier releases, at least it was possible to turn it off. Then identify all the client destinations which do have stored dialogue users in them. Those we uh, removed completely or changed the users to be system users. Then uh, those that remained <clears throat> that had stored logon credentials, so there was a fixed user, system user in the connection. Uh, we developed a naming convention for the users in the case that we had to change the user themselves. And uh, then we analyzed all system trust relationships to identify that there were no systems that were trusted by a, a, a trusting system where the trusted system was coming from a lower security classification. For example, the, a sandbox should not uh, be trusted by a production system and things like that. And 
the main uh, part of the uh, work was actually in correcting the authorizations and not the initial setup of the of the connections. In other projects, it can happen that uh, exchange working and uh, getting the this homework, so doing cleanups of all the dead connections and obsolete connections and developers who have immortalized themselves in the connections and, uh, or all connections running under the same user that can have and hard coding of the usernames that can also be a considerable effort. That was luckily not the case uh, in Diner. They had been doing their homework uh, beforehand. So the golden rules to ensure a hardened connectivity uh, scenario is that the RFC connections and the user in the connection should ideally have a one-to-one -one relationship so that there's one connection outbound one user under whose that uh, connection is running in the target system, ideally the user named after the source system, so if there's problems you know where the call is coming from, and supporting uh, ideally one scenario or scenarios that are compatible with each other. If you mix it, for example, worst case scenario, you have solution manager monitoring, you have the CUA, you have BW extraction, and you have IDOCs, all running under the same user, then you cannot actually separate the authorizations into nice, clean, differentiated scenarios because even if you build five different clean roles, you have to assign them to the same user and the other connections can do things which will be able to call function modules <coughs> that are not a part of their uh, <coughs> intended scenario. So uh, on the source system, one can also restrict uh, development access to users who can run function modules from transactions such as SC37, but uh, that is not 100% watertight, or it's not a guarantee that it's not going to be called because there are many applications that call function modules. There are many places where in customizing you can define the name of the function module and parameters you must send, and there are even RFC software development kits where you can, outside of ABAP, program your own uh, RFC connectivity to an SAP system and uh, call ABAP function modules from macros or Excel spreadsheets and other non-SAP systems. So only relying on authorizations in the source system is not a, a complete um, uh, containment of the risks. Um, what we also did to reduce the complexity is that we separated the RFC server functions from the application processing, which was the job users. And we first went live with all the RFC users. And once that was running smoothly, we did the batch users as a second step. We didn't go live with them at the same time, because if something didn't work, we wanted to be able to cleanly see where this is coming from. And built roles based on these function groups. So in almost all cases, we authorized via the function modules, we all authorized the function group. Only in isolated cases, uh, we applied a blacklist approach where there was a function group with, let's say, 10 function modules in it, and there was one black sheep in there that we couldn't get separated from the others and couldn't control via application authorizations. Uh, then we used a blacklist approach based on individual function modules. And about 10% of the coding at Daimler is custom developed. Uh, so we also ran code scans on those to see what those function modules are doing, if there are any vulnerabilities in them, if they are used, and only authorize those that are actually being used and not all that exist, and uh, documented which authority checks they made via SU24, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment. So the RFC optimization service, which is offered by SAP, um, See, there are no further systems, so we'll continue. We must keep an eye on the time as well. So the starting situation was that there are a lot of connections, and they are running with SAP all or comparable authorizations to SAP all. And uh, we implemented new grouping of these authorization requirements of the users, correcting the setup where that was uh, usable and build, building reusable roles to contain what these remote uh, users are doing. The uh, uh, service includes first identifying which roles are going to be needed 
then functionally describing the roles and also building the menus. So much like you do with the correctly built uh, user dialog user role, we built roles for these users where into the menu of the role we didn't put transaction codes, we put the function modules into the menu of the role and uh, that grouped them in folders so that one could see via the menu what which function modules the users equipped with the role are calling and maintained then also SU24 for function modules. So if we saw there was a certain authorization in the role, we would have complete where used list to see which function module is actually responsible for that authorization. And if we were to make a change to it or deactivate it, then we know which function module is going to run into problems uh, from that. So <clears throat> uh, then we went into testing. That was done in part with, or most, mostly with the simulation mode. Uh, but we're also using the role builder agents uh, in the test systems. Uh, there were some tests which to some degree gave us some insurance as to uh, what was going on and uh, what, was, what would have happened in production. And then we went uh, ahead with this protected go live phase <coughs> where uh, the role builder agents monitored the users and if anything had have happened, they would have jumped in and fixed the authorizations and sent us alert mails. I've already uh, explained the phases, so I'll, I'll uh, not go into any depth here, but you will have a copy of these, um, these uh, slides still, but the uh, detailed tasks, what we did, did was to first, for the scoping, extract all the RFC connections, and then get all the users uh, that were uh, in the, in the target systems as being on scope. In this case, isolated first on three systems. Uh, and then had a one-day workshop with the customer to introduce the procedure and uh, do the initial installation of the software on the systems. Uh, on the second day already, we started with the implementation phase. So we set up uh, uh, accounts where they were necessary according to the naming convention. To a large extent, Daimler already had good housekeeping there so there was not a lot of changes that were needed. Then we created already uh, using our software suite to create the uh, new roles and also created the new authorizations uh, by entering the function modules into the menus of these roles. This is done automatically by the software. And for all known scenarios, we also deliver the uh, SU24 proposals for the substandard function modules. Uh, which are grouped into these scenarios. So there's a friends concept. If someone does Solman monitoring, then one can also do click the refresh button and little examples like that that one finds with time. And these SU24 proposals are also upwardly compatible. So we currently maintain them on up, up until release 750. Daimler's systems were primarily 7.31 systems, but that means when they upgrade to 7.40 or 7.50, uh, they will most likely have nothing to do because the AC24 is already designed to enable uh, them uh, on the higher releases as well. And <clears throat> then activated the productive test simulation uh, to passively monitor the users with their new roles to see whether those roles cover all of their authorization requirements and something would have failed. The go live phase, finally, uh, we let the role builder agents monitor the users for another three months. One needs at least one, one month in and uh, to be safe, we do that for three months. That's why the, the project was mostly live already in January 2016, uh, but we carried on monitoring them until March and Daimler had licensed the software permanently, so they actually still have been monitoring those RFC connections today in case there's a release, release upgrade or someone changes a process somewhere and it has authorization relevance, then the role builder agents will alert them. So briefly to the software now, uh, what we did <coughs> was the, the software and different modules of the software uh, are used in different uh, types of systems. So if we start on the development system, there we have a module called the ABAP Alchemist. That's a code scanning tool, which we use for scanning the custom developments. And it scans it for vulnerabilities, uh, SQL injection, 
but also for missing authorization checks. That means if the function module is selecting from a table or working with a data object which is classified by the alchemist as having a semantically correct authorization object which should be protecting that data, then the alchemist will scan to see whether the function module is making also an authority check against the correct object. So you can scan it for authority checks that are not there but should be there. And from all the authority checks which the ABAP alchemist does find, it works out uh, from which function module or also web services uh, or program these uh, authority checks can be reached from or are reached from based on the call stack of this function module. And that gives, that exports a list of authority checks in a similar format to a trace, but the source is a code scan and not actually a normal SD01 authorization trace. And then we compare what the function module is actually checking with what's in SU24. And generally, at least for custom developments, there's nothing that's maintained for function modules in uh, SU24. And we can, with this ABAP Alchemist and a large code scan, and let it run overnight, we transfer the existing authority checks into SU24 from directly from this, this tool. And for those that are missing, we report them to the developers that an authority check would be appropriate, but there wasn't one found. Then with the role designer, uh, that is a tool where we can import all the users, all the function modules they are calling for the batch users, also all the transactions they are do, performing in batch input processing for web services, exactly the same. And within this role designer, one can, in a virtual environment, play around with these roles and invent roles and delete roles, but they are not PFCG roles. They are only known to our designer. And then there are tools which will work out the, what we call clustering. So they will work out where are the scenarios. There are, in total, 105 users. They can be grouped into 18 comparable scenarios because of what they are doing. So one can then create 18 virtual roles, assign the function modules and the web services to these roles, assign the roles as planned authorizations to the users until one sees that one on the one hand has a 100% coverage of everything that has been performed in the system. And on the other hand, that where there is an authorization overkill, that that authorization which the user would get does not contain anything critical uh, that they don't need. So one can play around with this other, with this role designer until one is happy, and then uh, transfer via APIs. One can transfer the roles into PFCG and also perform the role assignments to the users or extract it as a file later on for production system go lives. But we went, we fi we corrected the authorizations of the RFC and the batch users and the service users for the ICF connections in all of the systems. So. The work was done in development, but the roles were reused and retested and re-simulated also in uh, the test and production systems. In the role builder, we only used, uh, in the test systems, we only used the role builder because all this information was coming through SU24, roles were coming through as transports, and we went live in the development and test systems already on the first day, on the second day of the project. Uh, and the role builder then monitored them uh, and created delta roles where they, wherever there were things we had overlooked. For example, there was a scenario where there was an RFC connection from the test to the production system, and on a daily basis it looked for new uh, cost center master data and then replicated it back onto the test system. That basically saved them from doing a client copy every day or a partial client copy. And that connection was only running in the test system. It wasn't running in production. And uh, so uh, if little surprises like that uh, can happen, then the role builder will fix it within a three second interval and send alert mails out. And within production, uh, we used the uh, role profiler. That's an analysis tool for working out the coverage of what users are authorized for via the menus. It completely ignores manual profiles such as SAP all and works out whether what the user is doing will cover their authorization requirements. One can also automatically generate role menus from that during the analysis. Exciting times is the software module we use for this productive simulation mode where we can separate old authorizations from new authorizations 
and write a log whether an authority check would have failed. And finally, once we were live with uh, also in production, the global the agents were activated there to monitor the user just to be 100% sure that it's really a protected go live. If anything did go wrong, then it would fix it uh, immediately. And that is necessary because if you if something if things go wrong in the night and you have half a million short dumps and uh, the balance sheet is skew, then probably you're not going to be allowed to fix RFC connections very quickly again. So these tools, <coughs> excuse me, these tools uh, are necessary to ensure uh, that the project runs smoothly. And I have a couple of screenshots of uh, the tools that we deployed on the project. First of all is the role designer used to calculate roles and assignments. So this is what it looks like. On the left hand side we have the uh, function modules organized by their components which are used at all somewhere in the system. On the right hand side we have the users and the user types uh, which are making function calls coming into the system. And in the middle, we pair these together by using the reporting uh, via the reports tab there to work out which roles we're going to need. And if that's the role, which function modules belong into the menu of the role and which users must I assign it to to get to a 100% coverage without a critical authorization being included in the, <coughs> included in the excessive authorizations. As you can see here, we have a total of 283 users. They are calling 1,147 function modules, and the current setup here is in the screenshot here is 24% completed, or there's a 24% coverage if these were the roles with these function modules, and if they were assigned to the users in, in uh, as had been pl as planned within this designer application. So one can model it until one is happy and only then transfer it into AC24. Then within the role profiler, uh, we also analyzed the batch jobs uh, and used the approach there uh, that we split them by module. That's primarily because Daimler had a central batch administration uh, for the users. And what this application did uh, what this application does is that it finds all the programs or commands running as steps and then goes looking on the one side for transactions which start that program because SG24 is typically maintained for transaction codes but uh, not for function modules and you cannot maintain it for programs. So it look, goes looking for relating, so the way used list from SE38 is run looking for transactions. Then we scan them also with the alchemist to see which authority checks those programs are making or which transactions they are calling in batch input files and generated the roles there uh, for the uh, different batch users that were being used. Then the ABAP alchemist, that's the code scanning for defects and checks. So what we can see here is an example of uh, some function module which SUSE ZPV landscape get. So this one is used to display RFC connections in a CUA landscape. And uh, what it does is that it finds via the code scan that it is making these authority checks and compares that to SC24 to see whether it's there or not. And uh, if everything's green, then everything is okay. If the object is there, but the field is not there, so it's check yes, but proposal no then it's going to warn here, and in other cases uh, the field value might not be correct, or there's a value but it's not the correct one, uh, then it will warn you and let you transfer them. The goal being that you can build roles for these users only via the menu. That means you don't have to, if you get the menu right and you get SU24 complete, all the application authorizations are corrected as well. That's not the case of had importing SAPL into a role and taking a few things away, uh, not knowing whether it's correct or not to take it away. These are properly built menu-based roles with AC24 uh, proposals. 
the advantage of the alchemist is also <clears throat> that some of these connections only run once a month. So if you want to even simulate, you have to wait until month end to see what the thing is doing at all. With the code scan, you can already find out what the heritage checks is making without having to execute the actual program itself. So from the code scan, it already told us uh, the majority of what these programs were good for, and we could maintain SU24 for almost everything and only needed to catch exceptions via the simulation mode, <coughs> which the code scanner could not find. Then the simulation mode itself, <coughs> how it works is we have a user which has uh, its old authorizations, and we don't take, let, let's say for simplicity's sake, the old authorizations is SAP all. We don't take SAP all away. What we do is we build a new role to the best of our ability under the assumption that you can build 90% of a role very quickly and the last 10% is quite a trouble. So we build the role to at least 90% completion and then assign this new role via our exciting times productive test simulation mode indirectly to the user. And what happens then is that we have a job running in every three seconds, same as the role builder. It will look to see whether the user uh, has in their buffer what you know as transaction SU53. It will look to see whether there are any authority checks that are successful there, but the reason for the authority check is that the old authorizations were used and not the new ones. And we group these two authorization groups uh, into old authorizations and new authorizations such that the new authorizations are always given preference first. They are checked first. So anything that the new role authorizes, authorizes the user for needs much faster to a successful authority check. And if the new authorization, because there's one role that's much leaner than what the old conglomerate or the old SAP all group of authorizations are, it's only if that is not successful, then it starts looking in the old authorizations. And if that is, for an example, say SAP all, then it will be successful and our tool keeps a log of those. So you can just turn it on and walk away and uh, it will, you can carry on building these authorizations from the old role into the correct place in the new role. So via AC24, it tells you also in which context the authorization was missing. And uh, eventually when these simulated errors stop, then you know that the new role covers all authorizations which the user actually needs, and then the old role can be taken away uh, from the user. This is what the reporting looks like. So here we can see there was there's a batch user uh, which has successful authority checks, but these are from from uh, the simulation mode. So it's telling us that these checks would have failed, but they didn't. And it came from this function module. It came from this function module. Those are all the values that it needs, and transferred. We transferred. Uh, those into SU24 for the function module. The function module was already in the menu of the uh, user's role and then the authorizations which adjusted on that. That's how the simulation mode data flowed back into the new role on, in the development system and was transported through. The tool also shows us if there are some SAP nodes which relate to exactly that coding location. In some cases they are useful OSS nodes to know about how it works and in some cases they are also security corrections. If there's anything relevant there, you can also see read OSS notes which relate to that object or relate to that program. And finally, <clears throat> once we were live, the role builder agents uh, were activated for those users which uh, we had to make changes to and monitored them for a period of three months. And if anything went wrong, uh, then it would, within three seconds, co correct it on the one hand, but also send an email to a distribution list, which ourselves and the one colleague from Daimler was on, so that they could see uh, that the role agent had corrected something. And the idea is then to take these roles and uh, whatever authorizations they contain, that's obviously something that really went wrong, and 
build them into the new roles, transport the new roles through, and then delete these delta roles from the role builder agent again. They are just a temporary, a temporary means of getting over the hurdle of a missing authorization. And at the same time, they are a work list of things that need to be corrected in the roles before they can be removed again. This is an example of the email that sends out Daimler in Mannheim. It was, of course, in, in uh, uh, German. So, uh, but this is basically just an email saying that uh, a certain user in a certain system at a certain time had an authorization error, and the role builder corrected it uh, so that one can see what's going on. Okay, we have one minute left, at least for the presentation time, and uh, the uh, finally, there's a SAP note, this note 1682316, which you can uh, go to on the service marketplace. It contains information about the service if you want to book it via SAP. And uh, there's also a training course even where one can learn how to uh, use expert tools to perform such redesigns of authorizations in general, including also some exercises <clears throat> and information on how to, if you want to do it yourself or with more resources from yourselves, uh, to optimize your own RFC users' authorizations. And within that uh, SAP note, there's also a presentation where from SAP there's a, uh, a flash uh, uh, slide in there which gives you the possibility as an indication. It won't automatically generate a purchase order, but as an indication, you can set here the number of RFC connections that you have in your landscape in total. They were quite easy to count from the RFC desk table, from the development test and production systems, but not sandboxes. Those, those clean themselves via copies, or they are not connected at all then you can also work out or estimate for yourself what your own internal uh, cost rate is if you do it, perform such a RFC optimization or technical use optimization yourself. Then estimate how many hours you would need per RFC connection to uh, uh, analyze, authorize, and uh, assign the roles to them. And then, as far as GoLab support is concerned, that of course depends on how qualitative this prior analysis and the roles are built. That can be more or sometimes less effort. Uh, but you can use this as a little bit of an indication for yourself at what approximate cost uh, it comes if you order the SAP of RFC optimization service uh, to be performed for you, uh, or if you want to tackle it yourself <coughs> uh, with. Uh, using your own manual effort, then the effort goes up considerably, uh, or whether you want to use a software-based solution uh, to see what what that produces. Okay, that's the slides from our side. Are there any further Questions from anyone? You can type on your, on your right in the control panel. You can type questions in there. We can see them. And there is at least one more question, Julius. Um, okay. But um, the question is, how did you ensure that all end-to-end -end scenarios are covered in test system? What was the overall testing effort three months in total? Or, yeah. Uh, first of all, the test system uh, is not a good benchmark to use as a test system for such technical user authorization adjustments. Normally, the basis deschedule all the jobs. So if you want to authorize a batch user correctly, then in the test system, their job isn't running. Even if you can get the job to run, the test system, if, if the job, for example, will go looking for production orders from today and will process them or make uh, accruals based on them if the, if the uh, goods had not been received yet or anything like that. Now, that job from an application perspective is dependent on there being data for it to process. 
if it goes looking in the test system and they see it sees for today there are no production orders, it does nothing. But in production, it will find the production orders, need authorizations to display and select the production orders and for the subsequent processing. So the, the, the effort in the test system was actually minimal. We built the roles based on analysis in production, test and development, but in test and development there was hardly anything going on. And we already on the second day of the project went live with the development and the test systems uh, and activated these role builder agents. So we didn't go and monitor once a day or permanently to see what's going on in the test system because where something was going on at all, uh, the role builder agent was reporting it to us. So what the, the role builder agent is the tool that had sent that email. It's looking in every three second intervals for all the users that are in scope for us to see if they have, if they're running into any authorization problems which really are failing. And if it finds it, it goes through a blacklist and doesn't do, do anything which is regarded overly critical and generates per failed authority check a role puts the authorizations into the role, has some application logic to override some things or some special objects and assigns it to the user and sends the email out. So the, the effort involved in uh, ensuring that end-to-end -end scenarios are covered in tests in the test system was near zero. Now the bigger effort but still manageable was to use the simulation mode in production. So we built roles to the best of our ability and then assigned those roles indirectly to the system users running the RFC connections to simulate what would fail if they only had the new role and they didn't have SAP all anymore. And for some users, a day or two was sufficient because they were very talkative and doing the same thing the whole time, so actually quite a boring connection or boring interface. Uh, and those we could go live with quite quickly because they were reliable. And others would call one function module one day, and then a week later call a different function module, so there was a certain degree of unreliability in what they were doing within production. And then, of course, we simulated for longer. But the simulation testing effort was also a job running for us and how much effort we had depended, depended on how much it could find. So the, the third day we were still on site. On the fourth day there was almost nothing coming anymore so we let it go for a week and then came back after a week to see what the log looked like and then it took us uh, let's say half a day to process those simulation errors uh, per system landscape, but it depends on how many there are. Uh, by transferring them to SU24, or correcting the menu of the roles, transfer the roles through, delete all the simulation logs, and then we let it run for a month. And as we noticed that there were users that were not bringing any simulation errors anymore, we would switch them live and activate the role with the agent to carry on monitoring them anyway. So uh, in total for the for the 105 users that were um, in scope for these systems. Uh, it took 100 days in total, but uh, the effort was about 15 days on our side and 15 days on SAP side to do, the, to do uh, that project part for them. And that can roughly be split into a third is analysis and role building, a third is for actual uh, simulations and go lives in this in depending on when the user is ready for it and a third of it for uh, post go live questions and monitoring that came afterwards just as a rough a rough estimate uh, for you All right, thank you very much, Julius. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Again, we will be sending out links with a recording and uh, a copy of the slide deck. So look out for those emails. And again, I thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Goodbye.